So ladies and gentlemen, today the decision was made that we're going to be doing organic chemistry. Um, please note that that means that next week we will be doing our electrochemistry. That was the plan that we came about with today. So without further ado, I'm going to get started by sharing my screen and we're going to get moving through organic chemistry. All right. I am aware of the fact that this is one of those sections that well, all of your schools should have done right at the beginning of the year. So this is very much, I hope, a case of revision. But as always, when it comes to revision, I work on the basis that there were some people who never got anything the first time around. And because people didn't necessarily understand anything the first time around, it's very important that as I go through this, I make sure that I give you a decent opportunity to um, ask questions and hopefully to understand it the second time around. Okay, just give me a second, I just realized I need to quickly turn that off. Okay. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, today we are looking at organic chemistry. I'm going to try and prevent myself from doing too much of a, a spiel about why organic chemistry, because they're never going to ask you, but it's worth noting. Organic chemistry is the chemistry of carbon containing compounds. And effectively, it's one of the largest of the three sections that makes up chemistry. If you go and study um, chemistry at university, you'll discover that there's, chemist there's organic chemistry, inorganic chemistry, and physical chemistry. And organic chemistry, in my perspective, was by far the biggest. We deal with a tiny fraction of everything regarding organic chemistry. We view carbon as the building block of all matter that makes up life. And one of the reasons specifically for carbon is that carbon can form four bonds. Silicon can as well, but silicon doesn't form stable double and triple bonds, whereas carbon can. So what I wanna to quickly touch on with you is the bit that's gonna get examined. I can teach you a lot about interesting things, but they're unfortunately not gonna be where we get tested. So I'm gonna try and, and stay on the path of what you're going to get tested today. So importantly, you must know that carbon always forms four bonds. There are no exceptions to this rule. If you've got a stable carbon containing compound, every carbon atom will have four bonds. Those can be four individual bonds, as I've shown there, or they can be a double bond and two single bonds. We do get a case where carbon has two double bonds, but that's only really in the case of carbon dioxide. And although I said organic chemistry is the study of carbon containing compounds, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and carbonates are all excluded from this definition of organic chemistry because they're not viewed as being living, okay? So usually we don't look at two double carbon bonds. And then lastly, what we've got here is a triple bond and a single bond. Most of you should be aware of those. Okay, so when it comes to organic chemistry, we're looking at all of the different compounds that contain carbon. Now, I'm going to start off by looking at the different homologous series that we get. We're going to look specifically at a number of different homologous series, and they are specifically a homologous series because of their functional group. All right, so a homologous series is a group of organic compounds with the same general formula or you could say that it is with the same, um, same functional group. I always view in my head, but you never write this down in an exam, that the homologous series are the families. Okay, so it's effectively which family of compounds does it belong to? What does it have in similar or, or, or in common with the, the other compounds that fit into that specific homologous series. So we got our homologous series, and the reason that we get the specific homologous series is because of their particular functional group. And a functional group is the portion of the molecule that gives it its reactivity. So it can be an atom, it can be a bond, 
or it can be a group of atoms in any one or all of those in fact a group of atoms that is responsible for the reactivity of an organic compound. I like, once again, but don't ever write this in an exam, to think of the functional group as the superpower. What is it that makes that particular molecule able to react? And sadly, in the case of organic chemistry, some of the molecules have really pathetic functional groups that don't do very much, and others have very powerful functional groups that lead to them having a huge amount of reactivity and therefore being rather interesting to study. All right. Okay, so that just gave you a quick overview of what we're going to be doing in terms of looking at the homologous series and the functional groups. Now, before we go too much further, I also need to teach you how to count in organic chemistry. I know it sounds a little bit crazy, but you've got to make sure that you've got this counting down. I know most of you should, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you do. All right, please can I ask you to quickly take a screenshot if you need to before I clear the screen? All right. So when we count our number of carbons, we count them and we only need to know up to eight. So you only need to be able to count up to eight, any more than that, and they're not allowed to examine it. At least in the caps. All right, so one carbon is meth, two carbons is eth, three carbons is prope, four carbons is bute, Five carbons, oh, I did five twice, that's special. Five carbons is pent. Six carbons is hex. Seven carbons is hept. And eight carbons is oct. I can tell you firsthand that the two places where people are most likely to make a careless error is they confuse pent and probe. I don't know if that's because they both start with a P and their brain just says and it throws out one of the two and they get it wrong. The second place where people are most likely to confuse them are meth and eth. Other than that, you guys seem pretty good with them. Just a little bit of a hint with the meth and the eth. I always remind myself when it comes to which one comes first is who's number one. And number one, I know this is very selfish, but number one is me. Me becomes, comes before e. We don't even know who e is. All right. So meth, eth, probe, but, pent, hex, hept, oct. Okay, and that is going to be what we call the prefix of any naming that we do. So I'm going to break down nomenclature for you just now. We're going to look at exactly how we name things. When we name things, it's very important that you remember to count the number of carbons. All right, I'm going to assume, and I'm just quickly going to check with everybody that's here. So I'm quickly checking with you while you're here. Can I quickly, using a thumbs up, who here is pretty confident with what their homologous series are and feels that I can go through them relatively quickly and this is more of a recap than a teaching from scratch? Okay, so that's quite a large number of you. So what I'm going to do from that is I'm going to go quite quickly. If you find that I'm going way too quickly and you need me to slow down, please by all means do ask, but I'm going to go faster rather than slower. Okay. <laughs> Some of you may not like this, but we're going to do it anyway. So we're going to be looking at the following homologous series in order. Now, I'm actually going to quickly share my screen, and I'm going to share with you all of the different homologous series and functional groups that you need to know. So let me just quickly jump across. There we go. All right. So if everybody can see this screen over here, on the screen is every single one of the homologous series that we examine when we are doing, um, doing CAPS, all right? So if you're doing IEB, IEB doesn't do all of these. IEB tends to skip some of them. So I'm just gonna quickly make a little note for the IEB students. This here is not in IEB. Okay, you don't look at alkynes. I don't even know why, because it's not particularly difficult. And I think if I'm not incorrect, that you guys possibly leave off aldehydes and ketones. 
So you look, you definitely look at alcohols, carboxylic acids, and esters. But I think that those three over there are possibly left out of the IEB syllabus. Now, very importantly, these here are the structures of the functional groups that you need to know. So I'm going to quickly recap by running through these using this. Okay, so I'm going to mainly be writing on here because it'll speed up how, how much time we have to spend doing theory and how much time we can spend actually practicing. So when it comes to the alkanes, sorry, just give me a second. I've seen there's a question and I've got to go and quickly find it. Okay. Okay, please make sure that you only post messages on the group for me to check if I need to see them. Everybody gets checked by me immediately. All right, so if we're dealing with alkanes, alkanes always have the ending A-N-E. The functional group of an alkane is a single carbon-carbon bond. Okay, so the single carbon-carbon bond is the functional group of your alkanes. They end with the letters A-N-E. They only contain carbon, hydrogen, and carbon, carbon single bonds, but the single carbon, carbon bond is actually what makes them an alkane. So I'm just going to quickly make a little note here that they have the ending of A, N, E. And the other thing that's pretty important for you to know is that they have the general formula C, N, H, 2, N, plus 2. Okay, so if I were to, for example, talk to you about butane, you would need to know that but means four, ane tells me it's an alkane, and therefore the only important functional group that they have is the single carbon-carbon bond. So it would be one, two, three, four carbons joined together. Then you need to remember the other little rule that I told you just now, which is that every carbon has four bonds around it. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, and then it needs two, three, four. Now, many of you go to schools where teachers like me get lazy. I've had to stop doing this because I figured out if I was lazy, my students became lazy as well. But a large number of teachers will leave it at that point and they'll say, oh, you put in the hydrogens. And you'll go, yeah, no, we'll put in the hydrogens. But you never put in the hydrogens. And then when you get to a matric exam, there's so many other thoughts going through your head that the hydrogens get left off. So I have a rule, and it's a horrible rule because it takes forever, but I never, ever leave the hydrogens off. I make sure that my default is to always put the hydrogens on, and therefore when I'm in the middle of a matric exam and I'm stressed out and I'm not thinking, I put them on naturally. So I'll put them on even without thinking. So that over there is butane. If we want to see what the CNH2N plus 2 meant, that's where we come in and we now say, well, here there are four carbons. One, two, three, four. Every carbon has a hydrogen above it and below it. So when we write this in, N is the number of carbons. There are four carbons. Each carbon has two hydrogens, which is the two N. And then the plus two comes in because we're gonna plus a hydrogen on either end. So if we follow that rule, we say n is 4. This is going to be 2 times 4, which is 8 plus 2. So our formula is going to be C4H10, and that will be butane. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm giving you a very quick example because I know that most of you are relatively good with this. But can I ask everybody right now to please draw hexane for me? On a piece of paper, quickly draw in hexane. Okay, give me a thumbs up when you're done. And then we will compare our hexane molecules and check that you're all on the same page. And while you're at it, you may as well write down what we call the molecular formula. So our general formula was CNH2N plus 2. Our molecular formula is going to be like I did the C4H10 before, but it's going to be different because obviously hexane is different.
Okay, when you're done with all of that, if I can quickly get a thumbs up. Okay. Fantastic. All right. So I'm going to quickly resume my sharing so that you can see where we're up to. But your hexane should look something like that. Now, just a little important side note. What are the alkanes important for? Because you need to have a vague idea when we're talking about our different homologous series, what is it that makes the alkanes useful? And the alkanes are actually a really rubbish functional group. And well, they're, they're double, the single bond is a pretty useless bond. And therefore their function, the main thing that we use them for is we use them as fuels. This literally means that their biggest use for us is that we burn them. All right, and when we burn them, it's through a process of combustion. And I may, depending on how I'm feeling just now, if we've got time, quickly show you one of the combustion reactions. It's technically jumping into the reaction section, which isn't your typical question two. Today I'm focusing mainly on question two, but it's something you may need to know. So a little bit of background for you. Butane is the main component in cigarette lighters. And we get a small amount of hexane in petrol. Um, octane is the main component in petrol. Propane is what we burn as our, our typical gas gas. So if you've got a gas stove, you're probably burning mainly propane. So most of our alkanes are used as fuels. Um, diesels, diesel, petrol, any one of those are our typical alkanes. All right, we will come back when we do the section on reactions in organic chemistry. I actually meant, um, intended to split organic chemistry into three completely separate units, one for each of the questions, but we'll see how we go. All right. So ladies and gentlemen, as far as a quick recap of alkanes go, is there anyone who needs me to go into more detail or can I move on from alkanes and already look at alkenes and alkynes? Thumbs up if I'm able to move on already and you're all good. Okay, that looks like most of you. Please, if at the end of this, I skipped anything that you really needed me to do, come back and shout and ask me to go back over it. Okay, I'm going to try to get through most of this quite quickly so we can move on to slightly, I guess, more challenging stuff. All right, so our alkanes have the ending A-N-E, so they would be methane, ethane, propane, butane, pentane, hexane, heptane, octane. Once I've done or everything up to the end of the halo alkanes. I'm going to discuss isomers with you and then we'll start looking at how we branch them as well. But I'm not doing that just yet. I'll touch isomers once we've kind of got a little bit more into it. The next functional um, group that we're going to look at, instead of being a carbon carbon single bond, we're going to look specifically at the fact that you can have a double bond. Please note that al alkenes which have the double bond, can have more than one double bond, but our definition states that they must have at least one carbon-carbon double bond. So it's very important that we actually stress that it's a carbon-carbon double bond. It's not just any double bond. You can't have a double bond between carbon and oxygen and make it an alkene. It doesn't work that way. These will have the ending E-N-E -N -E and the... Um, the uh, general formula for them will be CNH2N. So you'll notice that we've effectively gone down two hydrogens from our alkanes, all right? And please note, you do not get methene. You cannot get something that's got a double bond between two carbons if you've only got one carbon. So our first alkene is going to be ethene, and you must remember here, the rule is every carbon has to have four bonds. So it's got one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Now you'll notice I draw them, with, so we've got a bond angle of 120 degrees. That is because when we did VSEPR theory in grade 11, we learned that as soon as you've got three groups joined, they all form 120 degrees between them. In a matric exam, we usually don't freak out too much if you make these at 90 degrees and put a bond up there and a bond there. But to be correct, I'm going to draw it like this most of the time. So over here, we'd get all of our hydrogens drawn on. We leave nothing without its hydrogens. And then our molecular formula will be C2H4. 
and what effectively has happened in forming the double bond two of the carbons will no longer need a hydrogen bonded to them to get to their four bonds so because of that that's how we drop the one um, hydrogen all right can i ask everybody right now to please draw for me butene and you may find that you're able to draw two versions of it so i want us to start looking at isomers but under the idea right now of butene so i'm going to quickly pause sharing my screen and i'm going to draw two versions of butene see if you can also draw me two versions of butene I should be more tricky at the end and say, once you've drawn them, see if as a bonus, you can name them. <laughs> but we'll see how you get there just now. All right, if you've managed to get to the end, can I ask you to quickly give me a thumbs up just so that I can gauge where everybody's up to? Okay, there was a question that I've been asked that I'm just gonna quickly ask, which says if the functional group of alkane is a single carbon-carbon bond, how is it you get methane? Rebecca, it's one of those special exceptions where we're allowed to just ignore the fact that you don't have the, the bond between it. So I guess we should technically change where we view it, but whenever we draw an alkene, we will always put in two carbons. So I understand the technical issue there. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it's, it's, I, I understand that it's one of those like uncomfortable things, but trust me, it, it works. All right, so the two that I've drawn here is I drew four carbons in a row, and four carbons in a row, the difference between these two is in this one the double bond was between carbon one and two and here the double one is the double bond is between carbons two and three so if the double bond is between carbons one and two we call it bute one in please note if you call it one butene it is the same thing but technically this version is more frequently used in the matric final exam so they tend to like you putting the one in the middle to show exactly where the double bond is but if you write one butene, it's perfectly acceptable. Both of them are allowed within the IUPAC naming. And over here, this is butene, or you could have written two butene. Please, just a little quick note here. We're never going to get three butene. Because as soon as we put the double bond there, this actually becomes carbon number one. Remember, we number the, the longest carbon chain according to the end with the most important functional groups around it. And as soon as you move the double bond to that position between three and four, then you'll start counting this as carbon one and you'd actually just enable one, two, three, four. So it'll be this exact molecule, but flipped over. Also with regards to whenever we put in our double bonds, we always number according to the lowest number that the carbon double bond is between. So if it's always gonna be between two numbers because it connects two carbons, but we always number it according to the lowest possible number that's there. All right, these two are isomers. Now what makes isomers special is that they have the same molecular formula. So both of these would be C4H8. They've both got four carbons connected to eight hydrogens. So they have the same molecular formula but they have different structural formula. And the structural formulae are shown when we draw out the carbons, the hydrogens, and how all of them are bonded together. All right, so those would be your structural formulae. Please be aware of the fact that we get three different types of isomers 
we get positional isomers, we get chain isomers, and we get functional isomers. These two are positional isomers because the position is differing. We've still got the same functional group. We've still got four carbons in the longest chain length. It's just exactly where they're going. All right, so this over here is a positional isomer. Fantastic. All right, so typically the important background thing that I'd like to put in for knowing about your alkenes is that your alkenes, because they've got this double bond, they are unsaturated. That means that we can add other things in here. And since we can add other things in here, oh, yeah, please stop that right now. I was about to go and name and shame you. <laughs> there we go. I'm just going to disable you. It's faster. Okay. So um, with us going in and having a look here at the, sorry, now I've lost track. So you mustn't do that. Okay. If we look at the, the position, they've both got five, uh, four carbons in their chain. So the chain length is the same. All that's going to be different is the position of the double bond. Everything else is the same. Okay. All right. Sorry, that's what I was getting lost. So I said that they are completely unsaturated. So because they are unsaturated, you need to remember that you can use them for your addition reactions. All right, so the addition reactions can do them. Okay, so that's everything that we need to know, I think, on alkenes. Let's move across to alkynes. Let's get left behind. Okay, so, oh, all right, this is very important. <laughs> I've just had a question, and it's, it's one that I think we do actually need to discuss. And it says, what is the difference between positional and structural isomers? Now, I hate the use of the word structural isomers because it confuses all of you. As far as matric goes, your structural isomers, let's try and write that correctly, your structural isomers are effectively all of the isomers you cover. So whenever we add the word structural into or before isomers, it's because every isomer that you cover is structural. There are two types of isomers that you don't learn about, and that is that we get optic isomers which you don't learn about at all and then we get structural isomers so every isomer that you care about is a structural isomer okay very important because a lot of people they're throwing the word structural isomer and suddenly your brain goes oh my gosh and you're trying to fit three different types of isomers in and you're counting one of them as structural and it falls apart so all isomers that you deal with are structural isomers. So if I call them structural isomers or just isomers, same thing. The three types of structural isomers that we get are positional, where the position of the functional group differs, chain, where the, different, where the, the longest carbon chain changes because we get more side branches or substituent groups. Side branches and substituent groups are the same thing. And then the last thing that we have is a functional, uh, sorry, yes, a functional isomer where we have different functional groups. But all three of these are structural isomers. Please, that is such an important thing to remember because my experience with this is as soon as I stick in structural isomers, you think it's one of these three and you lose track of what you're doing and you kind of get very, very lost. Whereas you need to note that the reason we say that they're structural isomers is that their structures change. What's bonded together changes. Optic isomers are very strange because they've actually got the same structures. The same atoms are bonded together in exactly the same arrangement, but what makes them different is like my two hands. My two hands are identical, except they're not. If I try and put my two hands on top of each other, my thumbs don't match up if I do them. So when we deal with optic isomers, we usually deal with things where the, the important groups are on different sides of a double bond or where they're literally non-superimposable mirror images, but everything else is the same. You, however, do not learn about optical isomers at all. So all of your isomers that you deal with are structural. 
All right. I hope that kind of cleared up something with regards to <laughs> how the structural isomers come in, because I tend to find that you guys get muddled up with the words and then you get very, very stressed about them. Okay. All right. I hope that was the thank you. Not, not a please re-explain again. Okay. Fantastic. So I'm going to now move on from my alkyne, alkenes to alkynes. Now with an alkyne, what makes them important is that they have got a carbon-carbon triple bond. Okay. And that carbon-carbon triple bond actually limits them very much in terms of how many hydrogens you can get. So their general formula will be CnH2n minus 2. Can I please challenge everybody? I would please like you to draw pentine for me and tell me how many different isomers of pentine you get. So my challenge right now is for you to draw every version of pentine that you can by moving that triple bond around. Okay, I'm going to quickly pause. I'm going to draw mine and then I'm going to check in with you. Okay, please don't branch them. I only want linear versions of this. We'll discuss branching once we've done these three now. Okay, so not just yet. But count your hydrogens and position them very carefully. This is where a lot of people get confused because they don't count to four correctly. Okay, if you've got as many versions as you can, give me a thumbs up so that I know that you're done. Okay, good. All right, so I'm going to share mine with you. I only managed to get two isomers here. So what I did was I put the double bond position between carbon one and two, and then I did it between two and three. And I realized that if I put it between three and four, it was technically the same as between two and three. And if I put it between four and five, it was technically the same as between one and two. So just be careful here where the double where the sorry the triple bond is over there you've only got one hydrogen there and none on this carbon and here in fact you lose from both of the carbons that you don't have any both of those have got the molecular formula c5h8 all right okay so i'm going to do just a little bit more testing and making sure that everybody's got these ideas please note that the three um homologous series that we've done so far are actually very important because the alkanes, alkenes and alkynes are together called the hydrocarbons. And I find that if you've got a very good understanding of your hydrocarbons, everything else builds on your naming and your formatting of your hydrocarbons. Okay, so can I please double check, has everybody taken a screenshot of my page here 
with the um, homologous series, the functional groups, I am going to come back and work on this just now, but I just want to go to my clear whiteboard where I've got enough space to do lots of working out. Okay, so I'm going to go and share across and I'm going to share onto a new whiteboard and then we can work from there. All right, so we actually left this one a little while ago with Meet Eat Probe. Now what we've added to it is we've added the understanding that if you've got a single bond, you get an ane. If you've got a double bond, you get an ene. And if you've got a triple bond, you get an ine. All right. Okay. Cool. Uh, you're welcome to send it, but rather send it later because I think we're going to add lots more to it in the next little while. So what we're going to start dealing with now is every version that I've given you so far has been a linear hydrocarbon. And when we deal with linear, it means that everything follows in one nice straight chain, like the word linear. What we also can look at is the idea of things being branched. Branched. And if they're branched, then they've got what we call alkyl groups. Now, what makes an, a group an alkyl group is that it branches off the main chain. So whenever we look at the main chain, we're allowed to have kinks in our main chain, but it's the longest successive chain that has all of the important groups. So we're going to start by looking at different organic hydrocarbons that have branches and try and identify the longest chain and what branches off it. So here's what many of your teachers do. We draw a beautiful chain like this and we hate drawing in all the hydrogens. So I'm going to quickly just jot them all in so that we don't forget them. But I'd like you to quickly look at this chain. I'm only going to be putting in hydrogens. Nothing else is going in here. I want you to quickly count for me and tell me what you think the longest chain is on this particular organic compound. So count your carbons and tell me the length of the longest chain. Okay. All right. So I'm going to assume that many of you have got there. Okay, I've got some options here. Someone says six. So I'm going to count. Now, what a lot of you do that's wrong is you count one, two, three, four, and you leave it there. What you've got to do instead is bear in mind that we can start and we can go anywhere. Okay. So I would start here with one, two, three, four, five, and six. Okay. I would not make that a side chain. Now, very importantly, that leaves me with two side groups, each of which contains one carbon. So when we label our alkyl groups, we also label them according to the number of carbons in them. So if they've only got one carbon, then it'll be a methyl group. If there are two carbons, then it's an ethyl group. If there are three carbons, then it's a propyl group. You'll notice that the common thing is that they have is the ending aisle. We can get a butyl group, but my experience is as soon as the, the group gets longer than that or that side chain gets longer than that, it's actually part of the main chain. So here's sometimes where people get confused is they make this one, two, three, four, I don't know, maybe even five and they get confused and then they've got an ethyl group. So over here, because each of these have only one carbon, these are both methyl groups. Okay, and because there are two of them, we would say that it is dimethyl. So when it comes to naming, there's a very tricky thing with getting all the bits together. So I often compare it to the order that I'd put them in. So I first of all want to know where. That'll be position one, two, three. Then I want to know how many. And then I want to know of what. All of these questions here is specifically referring to our substituent groups. Okay, now a substituent is underneath, so it's one of my branches or my side groups. So I want to know for every one of my substitu substituents, where is it, how many of them are, and what is it? Please note that these are all alphabetized. Then I want to know for my principal chain, which comes afterwards, I need to know number of carbons, and I need to know what its functional group is. If it's got any important functional groups, quite often we add in the additional detail 
that just before the functional group, I want to know where is that particular functional group. So this is a very weird way of listing it, but basically my longest chain is one, two, three, four, five, six. So the number of carbons gives me hex. The, there are no double or triple bonds, so this is straightforward hexane, and we don't have to say where the single carbon-carbon bonds are because they're not important enough. So that is my principal chain. Then I have to go back to my substituents. They are both methyls. So because they're the same group, I'm going to say how many as in di. So I'm going to use the terminology here, di methyl. Okay, and the where, they are in carbon number one and number four, so I make it one comma four dimethyl. Between two numbers, you put a comma, between a number and a letter, you put a dash, and between two letters, you should technically put nothing. These two should join straight onto each other. So this should be one comma four dimethyl hexane. Okay, and it is a branched chain, so we can say effectively that it's not linear. Please be very careful. They quite often in an exam. Sorry, why one, not two? Sorry, I don't know quite what the question here was. Why one, not two? There are, are two methyl groups there. I'm not quite certain. Please explain the question if I haven't understood it. Okay, why is the branch? Oh, sorry, you're right. It's two. That is right. Apologies, bad. There we go. Two. I read two. I circled two. I just wrote one. So it's two comma four dimethyl. Apologies. Thank you for explaining. If you ever have di, you need to know that you need two numbers in front here. If you have tri, so our number of um our number of the same group is you need to know that di means times two, tri means times three. Tetra means times four. Technically, penta is times five, but we usually don't find that we get penta in. All right. Okay. Can it be di two comma four methyl? My experience is not at all. All right. So I would never say this is di two comma four. We always put numbers before letters in this particular case, and the di comes in here. Next important thing here is that. The, we alphabetize them. I told you we alphabetize them. The ditritetra is not included in the alphabetizing. So this remains alphabetized as a methyl group. The next thing is, is when you get questions about which end to choose, you go alphabetically. We do not say that a halogen is more important than an alkyl group. You'll see that when we hit the next little bit just now. So we don't say that there's any difference between a halogen and an alkyl group other than alphabetizing. And we will always start numbering by the end that first hits a side chain or an important group. So if I hit carbon number two, even if there's a further, well, a lower alphabetical letter like bromine, a bromine will not beat, um, sorry, a bromine will not be able to beat a methyl if the methyl is closer to one of the ends. So the only time we ever start worrying about um, the numbering as in putting in one, two, three, four, five, and six in terms of alphabetizing the ends is if we've got two side groups that are equidistant from one from each end and then you've got to start deciding which one is more important. All right, ladies and gentlemen, there was a question from somebody just a little bit, a little while ago, and I'm gonna do just one quick example, but I'm gonna ask you very quickly to draw one more compound for me. And then we're going to go back and we're going to look at the rest of the different um, homologous series that we need to. Okay, I hope I'm not going too slow, but I think it's important that everybody kind of gets their brains working again. So can I please ask everybody to draw for me pentane, linear pentane. Okay, quickly draw pentane. Okay, and then to add to that, to make it a tiny bit more challenging, I would like to ask all of you to draw for me every single isomer 
of pentane that you can think of. Branching is allowed now. You're allowed to branch them. I want every single isomer of pentane that you can think of. I warn you, it gets a little bit challenging, so I'm sure you'll manage to do it, but just think carefully. So these here are likely, in fact, not likely, they have to be chain isomers. You cannot get an isomer of pentane that is a positional isomer because it's carbon-carbon bond doesn't technically have a position. If you can, even a bigger challenge is to label them all. All right, as a hint, you should manage to get two more isomers. So you should be able to draw a total of three different structures, all of which are isomers of pentane. Okay, can I ask for a thumbs up when you got all of those so that we can go through it? Okay, some of you will get used to get your hands back in with drawing hydrogens because they, they do require quite a lot of effort sometimes. All right, so if I show you what I've got there, that is my pentane with five carbons surrounded by 12 hydrogens because I remember it's CNH2N plus two. Over here, we've got our methyl butane. There's the methyl on four carbons. Here's the propane with one, two, three, and a cross. Just so you know how you can draw them when you've got to kind of eliminate or draw every single one of the different isomers, is it helps if you start with five carbons, then you say, all right, cool. My next one's only going to be able to have four, and then I've got a methyl group that I've got to stick on somewhere. And you'll realize really quickly that if you stick your methyl group on either end, then you go back to pentane. And if you stick the methyl group on carbon two or three, it makes no difference. You'll just start um, um, numbering from the other end if you had put it here. Then once you've done your chain of um, your main chain being four, then you realize you've got to do three. You can't put anything on either of the end carbons, or otherwise you effectively go to a length that's one longer. And then you've got your two methyl groups here. So both of these are in carbon two, so it's two comma two dimethyl propane. All right. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm hoping that that makes good sense so far and that your brains are starting to sh slowly but surely remember all of these bits. I'm now going to go back to where I was looking at before when we were looking at the different um, functional groups. No, not this one. Sorry, I don't know why it's not letting me go there. There we go. All right. So we've already looked at a couple of these. I'm now going to continue going through them. As soon as we move on to our haloalkanes, your functional group is technically a halogen atom. All right? And we can have fluorine, chlorine, bromine, or iodine. If we add in fluorine, we call it fluoro. Please just be careful. I don't know why a lot of people want to make the symbol for fluorine FL. There's no such thing, and if you do that, you lose your mark, okay? Cl is chloro, I is going to be iodo, and Br is going to be bromo. Once again, and I said this just now, but it's one of the most important things, your alkyl groups and your halogen groups are equally important. 
but when we have to prioritize one over the other, we do it alphabetically, which means that if we consider here that we may also have a CH3 group, which is a methyl, or a C2H5 group, which is an ethyl, okay, or a C3, now I've got to think very carefully, 6, 7, 8, 7, which is a propyl group, we will always prioritize them. I should put the Y before the L, propyl. We will always prioritize them in terms of alphabetical order. So bromo is always going to be one, then chloro is always going to be two, um, ethyl is three, EFG, that I think is four, that I think is five, LMN, that is six, and that is seven. So those are the order in which you prioritize them if you ever need to make a call. So for example, if I've got three carbons here and I stick a bromine group here and I stick an iodine group here and obviously everything else is halogens, sorry, hydrogens, long day, and everything else is hydrogens, then I'd have to decide does bromine or iodine, which end do I start number one on? And the rule is bromine is alphabetically before iodine. So this will be one, two, three. So in this particular case, it will be one bromo. Then it will be three iodo. And then because they're three carbons, it will be propane. So that is your big rule for learning about halogens is to make sure that you first of all know what the groups are and then you also are able to count them. Okay, so I find that halogens are slightly more useful than alkanes, alkenes, or alkynes, because they actually, the, halo, the, the halogen group is very good at leaving. It also gives certain properties. Um, your CFCs, carbofluorocarbons, those used to be used um, ages ago in refrigerators, and they had certain uses. We often use our haloalkanes as anesthetics, so they do have a couple of rather useful characteristics. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, at this point, I'm just gonna pause here for a second. We're gonna go and we're gonna do one example of naming, which kind of uses all of the skills that we've learned up till now. And then we're gonna race through the rest of these because I find that once you've covered up till here, everything goes a lot faster. All right, so please take a screenshot if you need to, so that you can know which groups go in which order. These ones underneath here, if you remember, I referred to them as alkyl groups because they're hydrocarbon side groups. All right, so I'm now going to quickly go and I'm going to share on my whiteboard. All right, so here's your challenge. I'm going to draw it, you're going to name it. Good luck. Sometimes with these I get very creative. Please be warned in an exam, they're not going to go quite as crazy as I'm going now because I think we're restricted to three functional groups and one compound. There is actually a number. Um, also, an important thing a double bond or a triple bond is more important than a side chain. All right. Okay, so the way that you'd use this, just a quick question, how do we use di and tri in addition to methyl or ethyl? If I've got two of the same side groups, then I call it dimethyl or diethyl. They don't have to be on the same carbon, they've just got to be on the same molecule. So anywhere on the molecule, if you've got two things that are the same, you may use them. I'll do the example now. If I viewed both of these as being a CH3 group, that makes it a methyl group. Please note, as soon as I draw it like that, I'm now doing what's called a condensed structural formula because I'm not showing every single possible bond that's there. But this would be a dimethyl because there are two methyl groups on here. Okay. All right, and that's about as nasty as I can make it. Right, let's make that weather. That's about as nasty as I'm gonna make it. All right, so everything else that I'm putting on here is now gonna be a hydrogen. Please try and name this. Please note that every one of those four, the three hydrogens is bonded in. I'm just not drawing it out in full. Okay, so that is your structure. I'm going to pause sharing while I try and work out what this is myself.
Remember, double bond has priority in terms of numbering. Okay, if you've got the answer ready, you can give me a thumbs up. <laughs> okay, well done. Okay, it's a good couple of you. Wait, I may have made a mistake. Yes, sorry, thank you. Let me correct that. There, you are correct. This is why it's so important to learn to count to four. The, the carbon that has a bromine on it, I put the double bond in, but I drew a hydrogen on it. I have corrected it on my own version. It'll be corrected when you see it just now. All right. Maybe I'll be good and take away the answer. Okay. So I'm going to quickly resume sharing. See that there's the correction. Okay. And I put my answer back in. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to share this with all of you now. That is the answer that I got. So, I'm hoping I didn't make any subsequent mistakes. But if I counted my longest chain, I got six carbons in it, which made it hex. The double bond is between carbons two and three. So, it's hex two in because it's a double bond. Then we look for our side groups. Now, I find the easiest way to avoid missing any of them is to circle them. Okay, so I basically say by saying hex 2 in, I have described everything inside that block, which effectively is everything else. Then I have to put them in alphabetical order. So sometimes what I do is I actually write them down the side here. So I'd write down bromo position 2, and then I'd write down methyl, and I'll see, wait a second, there are two of them, so it's di, but remember you alphabetize according to the M, and then because there are two of them, I need to remind myself that it's in position three and four, and then I've got an iodo on position five, and then I go and alphabetize B before I before M, and that gets me to my answer. All right, okay, so I'm gonna quickly stop sharing there. Can I quickly just check in with everybody? Is this making sense? Is this kind of building on with the knowledge you've already got? Okay, looks like it, good. And more importantly, probably, I'm just going to quickly wait for your hands to go down because this is the, probably the most important question I have. Okay, so hands going down. Let's wait and see. Okay, next important question that I want to know is who's learned something new today that they didn't remember or know before? Okay. All right, so for most of you, I haven't really covered. Okay, maybe as I wait longer, I need to give you longer to get your thumbs up. So about, I'd say about a third of you have already covered something new. So we're, we're going there. All right, so let's carry on going through the rest of the groups. All right. So we have looked at our hydrocarbons, our haloalkanes. Now we start hitting the groups that have got oxygen in them. And I usually find that between the alcohols, the aldehydes, the ketones, the carboxylic acids, and even the esters, it's very much about knowing what's connected to what. So I find that by the time we've reached this point, I can almost dump you in the deep end. Where it does get tricky is a lot of you get confused with which is which, and that's why it's so important that we do dump you in the deep end and get you used to the idea of struggling. So very important with an alcohol it's the hydroxyl the oh that makes it an alcohol all right alcohols usually end with an ol 
And the reason that they end with an, this an comes from that ain. So it's a single bond, single bond carbon, and then ol. Okay. They have the hydroxyl group, but be very careful. A lot of schools, at least when I was at school, we used to get away with drawing that as a hydroxyl group. So draw the structural formula of the functional group of an alcohol, or draw a hydroxyl group, and we used to draw that, and we'd get full marks. Please note, you nowadays need to show that it joins onto a carbon, and you cannot put anything specific in here. So if you go and stick in all the hydrogens, that is no longer the functional group. You have just changed this and you have just drawn methanol. So as soon as you put in all the hydrogens, it's no longer the functional groups. These groups as are drawn here are the exact ones that will be put on a memo. So make sure that you know them. So an alcohol has an O and an H. An aldehyde has the ending AL, and if we're gonna be very technical and you always laugh here, A-N-A-L, because the an once again comes from the fact that it's an alkane and then the al comes from aldehyde. Okay, so you can even look in here, there's alcohol, there's aldehyde. So we must remember that here it's a C double bond O straight onto an H, which is called our formal group. Okay, I'm gonna throw these in just now and juggle them up, so be ready for it. So if I ask you to draw the formal group, it's technically the C double bond O straight on to an H, but I could draw something else in before that. So if I've drawn this, this is an aldehyde because there's the C double bond O straight on to an H. Because it's got two carbons, this is called ethanol. All right. Then we're going to look at ketones. Now, ketones are very important because it's a C double bond O between two other carbons, okay? You've got to get these other carbons involved or otherwise it becomes a problem. So that's what makes it a ketone. A ketone has an ending, which is usually an own. Some people just call it the own, it doesn't really matter. But the an, once again, is because of the, the carbons usually forming coming from alkanes. So we're not going to get methanone or ethanone. The first ketone that we get has three carbons because the only way we can have a double bond O between two other carbons, okay, is if we um, have three carbons. This over here lists, this is a hydroxyl group, this is a formal group. This does have a name. It's a carbonyl group. I'm going to quickly write it in here. So this is your carbonyl group. So the ketone group is known as a carbonyl group. Okay, so it's a carbonyl group and if I drew it like that, okay, three carbons makes this propanone. And you actually deal with propanone quite often in households, it's called acetone. In organic chemistry, there's this weird thing with acet. And like, if you think about your, your um, acetic acid is your ethanoic acid. So it's this weird thing where sometimes there's certain molecules. It's usually the beginning of the, the different homologous series that get special names where it's um, acetic acid or acetone, but it doesn't always mean a certain number. Here, acetone has three carbons and in acetic acid, it's got two carbons. So just be aware of the fact that we use acetone, main component in nail polish removers. All right, our carboxylic acids have the ending um, anoic acid. Once again, the an comes from the single bonds. The reason I keep telling you that all of these ands come from the single bonds is if I put a double bond in, it could be enol or enal or enone or enoic acid. It's a bit of a surprise and it's a bit of a stretch. If they put that in as one of your questions, it is the, the tricky question in the paper. They're not really supposed to, but sometimes they, they kind of tend to just cross that line a little bit. So our carboxylic acid is a C double bond O straight onto an OH. So if I were to maybe do butanoic acid, it's got three carbons, double bond O, O, H, and then we just have to fill in the balance of the hydrogens. 
Okay. I'm going to pause before we go on to esters because esters are a totally different kettle of fish and we'll get back to that. But what I'm going to do is we're going to practice with me asking you to draw things or me giving you the structure and you me asking you to name them. So it's very important when it comes to studying that you know the naming for the hydroxyl, formyl, carbonyl and carboxyl. That will come up in almost every single exam paper. Okay as well as to know how to draw the structural formula of the functional groups, as well as knowing the individual names. So you need to know all of those bits and how to string them together just a little bit. Please can I ask you to take a snapshot if you'd like to, before I go and start quizzing you on these, and then we'll come back to Esther's just now. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I forgot to give you a shaking out your legs break. So I'm actually gonna suggest at this point before I start, just quickly stand up and have a little bit of exercise if you need to before you fall asleep on me. And then we'll keep going in just a second. Okay. All right. So <laughs> I'm going to ask everybody, and we're going to go through these relatively quickly, but I think that if you know your theory, you should manage to draw them rather quickly. So can I please ask everybody right now to please draw for me ethanoic acid. I'm gonna give you a few of them. So I'm gonna ask you to draw ethanoic acid. I'm gonna ask you to draw butanol. Um, and I'm gonna be very specific. I want you to draw one butanol because we do have different isomers there. I'd like you to please draw, um, to um, pentanone and I'd like you to draw one chloro just to, to kind of remind you about the different things, hexane. Oh, I forgot an aldehyde. We may as well stick in a quick aldehyde here. Um, can you please draw for me pentanol? No, propanol. All right. So if everybody can quickly practice drawing those, I'm going to quickly pause sharing as I quickly draw them in for you. All right, when you're done with all of those, please let me know by giving me a thumbs up. Okay, good. Okay, all right, so I'm gonna quickly stop share, well, start sharing again. All right, so you can quickly mark and check all of yours. 
ethanoic acid has to have two carbons and there is your carboxylic acid group okay which is your carboxyl group practicing reminding you things here the carboxyl group number two was but add one ol so this is carbon number one there's the oh that makes the hydroxyl four carbons if we did two pentanone you can see that on position number two, there's a ketone group. It's a ketone because it's the carbonyl group between two other carbons, and there are a total of five carbons. Chlorohexane is on number one. There's a chlorine, and there's a total of six carbons. Uh, sorry, six, yeah, six carbons, and then hydrogens the whole way around. And propanol, the aldehyde group, is the C double bond O straight on to an H, and there are a total of three carbons. Now, something that we need to discuss here very quickly, there are a good couple of things we need to discuss, but we're gonna, we're gonna start by discussing a couple of the details that fit in here. The first thing that I want to look at is whether things are saturated versus unsaturated. And the rule is that compounds are viewed as saturated if they have only single carbon carbon bonds so when i talk about something being unsaturated it has at least one double or triple carbon carbon bond that's important because that does not make something unsaturated this compound here is saturated. This one's also saturated. So is this, so is this, so is this. Every single one of these is saturated. But people often get confused because they don't remember that it's single and double, triple carbon, carbon bonds, and they forget, and then they get confused and they think, oh, it's just a double bond anyway. Also, when you do, in your, when you do your definitions, make sure that you don't write, there are only single bonds between. You must write there are only single bonds between the carbon atoms or there is at least one double or triple bond between the carbon atoms so i need you to know about the idea of saturated versus unsaturated the second thing that i need to talk about here with regards to us putting the ones on these positions is we can talk about primary secondary and tertiary haloalkanes and primary, secondary, and tertiary alcohols. So when we talk about something being primary, it means that the carbon that the functional group is attached to has only one carbon neighbor technically we're going to be very fussy here and we're going to say it doesn't have to have one it could have or none if something is secondary then the carbon that the functional group is attached to has two neighboring carbons So the first bit's the same, but it's got two neighboring carbons. And if something is tertiary, tert, that should be T-E-R-T-I, so that letter doesn't appear. Tertiary, it means that it will have three neighboring carbons. So if I were to clear all of this away, and I were to now draw a structure, and I make this a haloalkane, but I put in carbons all the way around here, so this will be a CH3, a CH3, just be warned. If you connect this to a carbon, we actually put the H3 on the other side. If you look at this chlorine, okay, the chlorine is attached to that carbon and it has got one, two, three carbons attached to it. So this would be a tertiary haloalkane. Okay, if I drew the following alcohol, Who can tell me, is this a primary, secondary, or tertiary alcohol? The one that I've just drawn here. 
primary, secondary, or tertiary? Anybody? I think you are still here. <laughs> okay. So the answer that I've got is secondary. Okay. Please be careful. It's not primary. Primary. It's not primary because this OH is attached to this carbon and it's got one, two neighboring carbons. So remember, if it's got three neighboring carbons, one, two, three, it's tertiary. If it's got two, it's secondary. And if it's only got one or in fact none, the reason I kept going on about the or none is that over here I have got a compound and if we counted from here, sorry, just trying to get my colors out. If we counted, there's the hydroxyl group, it's attached to that carbon and then none, but we're still allowed to call this primary. So as I mentioned, primary is that there's none or one carbon attached. Tertiary is that there are three and secondary is that there are two. They will usually, just for the record, try to catch you out on this. And the reason that they'll try to catch you out on it, I know that our favorite one, is we'll give you an option where we go, which of the following is a tertiary haloalkane? And one of your options will look like this. And some of you guys are so proud for knowing the tertiary means three, that you go, wow, look, that's a tertiary. Oh, sorry, lost my board completely. That's a tertiary haloalkane. And that's complete and utter nonsense, okay? So you've got to make sure this one would in fact not be tertiary. If you look at all of these, they're attached to a carbon that has no others. So this would actually still be a primary haloalkane. All right, so you need to make sure, and this is just me, I'm gonna quickly stop sharing for a second. You need to make sure that you understand what primary, secondary, tertiary mean. You need to make sure that you understand what saturated and unsaturated means, and you need to know all of your different um, functional groups, homologous series, special names given to them. Now, the last thing that I wanted to touch on today is I wanted to go back to the last bit that we haven't done here, which is the esters. Now, esters fall somewhere between um, us doing the question one, well, question, I call it question one, but it's technically your question two because you've got multiple choice first. So it falls somewhere between that question and the reactions. The important thing that you need to know here is you've got a C double bond O, then an O, then onto a carbon. What we're going to spend the remaining 12 minutes doing is we're going to look at esters, how you make esters, what, how you name esters, and everything linked to esters. At the end of today, you should have a vague idea as to how to start answering those questions. There are still a couple of things that I haven't done. I've, for example, looked with you at, at positional isomers and at chain isomers. I haven't yet mentioned functional isomers. I'm going to quickly throw it in. Our functional isomers are usually only examined when we look at these four functional groups. What you must realize is that with the same combinations of carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens, you are able, I not the first four, I need to extend this a little bit to esters, that carboxylic acids and esters can be taken apart and turned from one form into the other. Both of them have two oxygens, and both of them have a double bond. So it is possible for these two to be functional isomers of each other. I'm gonna do more examples on this, but probably not today. We'll probably have to wait till Thursday. And the other groups that do functional isomers are your aldehydes and ketones. So aldehydes can turn into ketones. So if I give you an example of an aldehyde and it's got maybe five carbons, I can turn it into a ketone with five carbons. If I give you a carboxylic acid with five carbons, I can turn it into an ester that's also got five carbons. So we're gonna come back and have a look at that. All right, okay, let's keep going here. So I'm going to quickly move across and I'm going to do my whiteboard with us doing esters and looking at esters. All right. So the important thing that you need to know or important things that you need to know about esters, firstly, is that esters smell nice. 
They are often very fragrant and people often say that we use them as flavorants or fragrances. Now, I always get a little bit, um, I laugh inside at that because if any of you have ever tasted vanilla essence or perfume, it doesn't taste nice. But, um, well, it doesn't taste nice in very concentrated amounts. So perfume I describe as being a fragrance, but I definitely wouldn't want it to flavor my food. But things, I guess, like vanilla essence, et cetera, you can have a mixture of the two. So sometimes in very low concentrations, you might get away with saying flavorance as well. So an ester is made from the reaction between a carboxylic acid and an alcohol. All right, so if we start over here and we say, all right, this is my carboxylic acid. I'm gonna go very simple to make this quick to draw. So here is my carboxylic acid. My carboxylic acid is methanoic acid. I could react this methanoic acid with an alcohol. Now, in order to be able to draw this easily, make sure that your functional groups face each other. If you draw them on, the, on different sides, it gets very hard to see. So my alcohol, for example, if I do an alcohol with um, two carbons, that would be ethanol, okay? So I've got methanoic acid and over here I've got ethanol, okay? And the important thing here is that these two functional groups face each other. You do not need to know the reactions in terms of the mechanism, but what I can explain to you is that this oxygen is going to join in with this carbon. <coughs> and what's effectively going to happen is that we can view it as this water leaving. Technically, the oxygen that leaves comes from your carboxylic acid, but if you draw it wrong, nobody's going to penalize you and you won't lose any marks. So what's effectively going to happen is that oxygen joins straight onto this um, carboxyl group and this bit leaves in the form of water. So when we draw it, you literally draw this carbon bonding straight to that oxygen. So the hydrogen is this one, then I draw into the carbon, double bond O, straight onto that oxygen, then onto these guys here, which is the carbon with two hydrogens and the carbon with three hydrogens. And the last bit that we get from this is our H2O. Now, most people lose their marks because they write H2O and they forget that the question asked them to please use structural formulae. So because they didn't use structural formulae and draw this water out properly with a bond angle looking vaguely like it's 104.5, they lose the mark. So if you just write this as H2O, you usually throw away one mark each time. Now, when it comes to naming an ester, I have a little bit of a cheat rule. There isn't an easy naming rule, so I use the best method that I can, which is I call it alcohol, aisle, carboxylic acid, O8. My alcohol was ethanol, so this becomes ethyl, okay? So that's what I mean by alcohol aisle is ethanol makes this ethyl. And then my carboxylic acid was methanoic acid. So it becomes methanoate. So what I've drawn over here is the carboxylic acid and the alcohol to make my ester as well as the water that I get. The one last thing that I haven't mentioned here is in order to make this reaction happen, you need H2SO4, sulfuric acid, most people view it as being a catalyst in this reaction, but some people actually teach that it's a dehydrating agent because it removes water. I usually recommend that you say catalyst first, but dehydrating agent is often accepted as an answer and sometimes as a secondary answer if you need two answers. The second thing is in order for this reaction to occur, we need to put in heat. In a chemical reaction, we can put in the triangle to show heat is being added but we could also describe this as happening under conditions of reflux. So as a rule, alcohol carboxylic acid makes an ester, and to name your ester, you need to know what your alcohol and your carboxylic acid were. Now, before I go any further with that, I just quickly want to double check, does everybody already know this bit about esters? Can I jump into 
backwards questions where I give you an essay and you've got to tell me what made it up, etc. Okay, that looks good. So I'm going to quickly clear it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw an ester for you. And I want you to practice now backwards with telling me what carboxylic acid and what alcohol made it. Okay. So can everybody please look at this and try and identify what the alcohol and carboxylic acids were that were used to make the specific ester. You need to practice looking out for the functional groups because sometimes it gets a little bit tricky to see them in among all of the other stuff that's happening. Right, so I'm going to quickly pause sharing while I work out my answer. Ma'am? Yes? Can I ask a question, but it's not really related to this topic. Uh, please wait till the end and then you can, all right? Is okay, that no fair? Problem. Good. Yes, all right. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I've already got to the end of that. I'm pretty sure most of you that were going to get to it got to the end as well. So my answer for this particular one was that the alcohol was ethanol and the carboxylic acid was butanoic acid. Now, in order for you to understand where that came from, I find that the easiest thing to do is to draw a dividing line through my oxygen. Why through my oxygen? Because that allows me to clearly see how many carbons came from my alcohol, because my alcohol does not have the carbonyl group, the C double bond O, and then everything else on this side is going to come from my carboxylic acid. Okay, going in here, if I look at my carboxylic acid and count one, two, three, four, okay, please remember you include the, what's now part of, well, I always call it a car carbonyl as soon as it's C double bond O, but technically esters don't have a name for their functional group. So this, the, whatever's part of the C double bond O, you, well, you must count that carbon. All right, can I quickly have a show of hands who managed to get that right? Okay, if you didn't, hopefully you now know it and it makes good sense. Now we're gonna do one that's different and I'm gonna give you the name of the ester and I want you to draw the ester for me. Okay, so I'm gonna quickly clear here and I'm gonna ask everybody if they can please draw me ethyl propanoate. Okay, go for it. Okay, you can give me a thumbs up when you're done with drawing it. Good. Okay, fantastic. That looked like quite a large number of you and I wanna try and get as many questions as we can in the last little bit. So that over there is my ethyl propanoate. Okay, and it, please, it doesn't matter at all which order you drew this in. So if you drew this and you started with three, but oh, sorry, I, I, mine's wrong. Wait, when you're not paying attention and it's only when you've got to flip it around that you realize you've got an, an error. Okay, so I had to have my double bond O, I completely left that off. Here, if we had the double bond O, O, and then I had two more there, okay, this is still perfectly acceptable. We, we don't even penalize you if you bend it around. I don't know where the tendency to bend the molecules came from, but there seem to be some, some groups where they've learned very clearly that you must have a C double bond O and then an O and then a C. And then they, they wanna do weird things that look a little bit like that. 
Okay, so as long as you realize here that you've got to have on the side that's got the C double bond, oh, they have to be three carbons, and on the other side, <laughs> you have fewer, you're going to get full marks. So we're very, very um, lenient with marking how it looks as long as we can clearly see that everything's there. Okay, so it can be forwards or backwards. We're, we're okay with being able to see what it is. Now I'm going to ask slightly tricky question okay last question for today is i would like you to please just draw me the structure of the carboxylic acid that is used to make methyl propanoate so all i want is the carboxylic acid that is used to make methyl propanoate i'm testing your listening skills today in an exam would be testing your reading skills, but I'm not writing this question out. Okay, so remember it's just the carboxylic acid that I want of this. Okay, you're nearly done with that. Hopefully, good. Okay. So that is my answer. My experience is when we ask this particular question in an exam, people are so excited that they know how to draw methyl propanoate that they draw methyl propanoate instead of just drawing the carboxylic acid of it. Okay. Also, if I asked you to draw the structural formula of the functional group of methyl propanoate, all that you'd actually need to draw is this. Okay, I think you actually have to draw in that carbon as well. No, you don't have to. This doesn't have to have it. It's just got to go there. Okay, so if you were asked for the structural formula, you've got to draw all of those examples that I gave you earlier on that sheet and make sure that you get it correct. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end of the beginning of organic chemistry. Um, we're going to call it a day here. What I will be doing in the next lesson is mainly past exam papers that we can check that you can understand everything. And I'm going to try and find some that are slightly irregular or unusual just to make sure that you're really comfortable with what you need to be able to.